G'day, I'm Glenn Morris from the Smart Energy Lab, and today I've got Chun from REC. G'day Chun. G'day, <laughs> thanks for having me as well. <laughs> How do you go getting here? It was pretty wet kind of weather yesterday, just drive through floodwaters? Yeah, it was actually very interesting because yeah, yesterday was really wet, but today was just sunny and, and good skies, you know, it's very sunny as well, like on the way here, so it's great. Like the drive here was great, the views were excellent, so. It was a very nice drive up here. Good. I'm glad you didn't get lost. Um, you know, it can be a little bit of an adventure sometimes coming up the mountain here. Occasionally there's trees across the road. Ah, uh, yeah. So driving up here was a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. I don't really drive out, you know, out further than, you know, out of city. So getting up here was a, was a good challenge and it was, yeah, it was pretty, it was safe. Well, I got here safe, so it's pretty good. Great. So, Chun, um, you work for a company called REC. Just tell me a bit yeah. about REC. So REC, REC is a well, solar panel manufacturing company. So what we do is we manufacture solar panels, <laughs> as it is. Um, and we are actually a Scandinavian company um, founded in Norway in 96. So um, we're just gonna bring it up here for you really quickly, as we can see here, right? Just the history of, the RE of REC in itself. So we were founded in Norway in 1996. And then, you know, they've been doing wafers and stuff like that. And then they started in Singapore in 2010. Now. So REC, we started manufacturing our panels in Singapore um, and the first iteration of that was the peak energy panels. And so that went on for a bit and then a couple of years after, um, we also discovered the half-cut cell technology. So we were one of the first few manufacturers that actually adopted that technology and it came up with our REC Twin Peak series. And then we got a Twin Peak and then you had Twin Peak 2 and Twin Peak 3. And then along the way, we thought about, look, you know, REC is all about trying to innovate. We're trying to be ahead of the pack. We're trying to push the boundaries of solar panels to another level. So... Hey, just hold for a second there. Yeah. So um, you were one of the first to introduce half-cut cells. Um, we were one of the first to adopt that technology. Yeah. And so that's why we came up with our Twin Peak series. So our, our peak energy was just, you know, um, a flat piece of P-type cell yep. um, panel. And then... Again, like we had the crossroads of we can either just keep doing what the market was doing or we can just go off the path and adopt this new technology and see where that takes us. So back then in 2016, or sorry, the 2015, um, that's when we adopted that half-cut cell technology and we just put it on the market as our Twin Peak series. Were they P-type? Um, I think the first ones were. Yep. And then as we went on and as it picked up, the half-cut cell technology picked up and it's when we trying to change, like we changed it to like an N-type and then um, on a mono perk and that's where you get like um, our Twin Peak series, our N-Peak series, that's where the N-type series um, panels are and then after that you get our Alpha series, the HJT cells, yeah. Now I can feel my audience asking a question already, so what's all this <laughs> business about P-type and N-type, John? So they're just different types of cells, mm -hmm. or like in terms of efficiency wise, it actually greatly differs from the P-type and N-type. So it's really just the, um, the wafer that's, that's used in the cell. So in a little bit, I'll get into that because the Alpha series, which I want to talk about after, is what we call as a heterojunction cell technology, HTT cell. And that actually gets a combination of different layers and different types across the years and you kind of just mishmash them together and you get, you know, the best of everything while trying to minimize the downsides of them. So coming back to the whole question of what's a P-type, N-type, they're just basically types of um, wafers that you use in your cells. And yeah, it just differs in, in efficiency and the N-type is more efficient than a P-type, which is... So yeah. P-type was basically what most monocrystalline cells were for a long time. Um, yeah. So that's a, a phosphorus doping of the base layer. Yeah. Um, and then we, you would have a, like a surface um, coating of N on top to give you the, the P injunction, right? Yeah. But the move has been away from P-type to N-type because, as you said, is efficiency. Exactly, yes. Um, but I believe it's like it was harder to manufacture, so that's kind of a bit of a breakthrough, making N-type easy and low cost. Exactly right. So I think back then, again, um, speaking from what, you know, speaking from history and what we can see, it's just that, yeah, moving from the P-type to the N-type, again, like that was a, a huge jump in the industry as well. And for REC as well, like that's how we came up with our m series, because we believe in that, in that jump. So besides just coming out of that half-cut cell panel, you know, we wanted to also put in, I guess, put our chips into the N-type series, and that's why we came out of the N-peak series. 
So that jump was as well. It's a little bit of a, um, again, for an REC, how we position ourselves to be um, industry leading or we try to be industry leading in the solar panel um, space in itself. And that's why we have our NPIC series. Now, coming back to half cut, it, it yep. seems a bit odd when you think about it, that you start off with a whole cell cutting it in half. How does that make it better? So it really just increases the efficiency overall, right? So the panel in itself, it used to be just one slab where, you know, you get your connections on that slab in itself. But the half cut, um, well, the Twin Peak series and what they do is they do, like, they cut the panel in half in that sense. Not quite literally half the panel, but we kind of cut that, that panel into half and that's how it, it gives you more efficiency overall because you can shade half the panel, for example, and the other half would still work. So when we found that technology out, like it is harder to manufacture because you can't just put the whole wafer in itself there. You have yep. to cut it into half. Um, but, you know, we, we took that, that leap of faith to kind of be like, hey, this is going to be, this, gonna, this, is what, this is what's going to revolutionize the solar panel market. And that's why we are like, all right, we're just going to do that. And yeah, it was a huge success. So isn't there something to do with Ohm's law as well? The fact that you are reducing the current uh, in each of the cells by halving them. Yeah. And so your losses, resistant losses are a bit lower. So I squared R equals power. So a bit yeah. less resistance, you gain more power. Exactly right, yeah. So with that as well, um, in terms of just the practical use of it, you know, is that, yeah, if you shade half the panel, you can use it half. But at the same time, yeah, exactly right. So if you cut the panel into half, your current is half. And you would see as well in the Alpha series as well, like this is taken to the next, next level where we're reducing current in itself so that it actually increases um, efficiency, as you said, like, you know, P equals I squared R. So if our current is a bit lower, right? And so resistance is as well lower, and we can get our power, you know, a bit higher in that sense. So we're getting higher power, lower, um, a bit lower current and lower resistive load. Sorry, a little bit higher current, but a little bit lower resistive load. That gives us um, a good um, balance of power and um, resistive loss or lower resistive loss. If that yeah. Makes sense. So it's all about squeezing more out of the same thing, basically, by using physics. Exactly right. Yeah. You know, the stuff that you have learned in high school, yeah, yep. that, that still comes into play. <laughs> yeah. It all comes together like in one full circle. Yeah, cool. Now, um, just coming back to REC, so they started back in uh, 1996 and they moved to manufacturing in Singapore. You've just been recently in Singapore, I believe. Yeah, so I've actually been, okay, so a little bit about me in itself as well. So what I do is, um, I'm actually born and raised in Singapore and I moved to Australia in 2015 for study. So I com completed my electrical engineering degree um, and then I actually worked at Enphase for about two years. So I did that and then worked at retail and then now at REC. So. Um, it was great going back, like a little, about a week and a half ago, I was back in the REC plant. It was actually really eye-opening being there in the sense of just how big the factories were, how meticulous they were, and true to the Singaporean culture, where everything is down to the wire, where everything is so um, microscopic that it's, it's, everything's just so focused. It's so laser focused, but everyone has their part to play and it just all kind of joins up and works together. So being in that plant in itself, just to see how the automation works there, um, that's actually, again, how advanced the plant is at the Singapore factory, is just really mind blowing. You're saying it runs 24 hours a day? Yeah, so while I was there, so what they're trying to do is, because to keep up with production, right? Because yes. a lot of the issues that we have is just production coming into the country. So what they're trying to do is they're trying to automate as much processes as possible so that they can actually run the plant 24-7 without infringing on any human rights laws, <laughs> you know? Right? We don't want to work anyone across the clock. Yes. Um, but with automation, what it does is it helps improve quality, it helps to improve reliability, and we know every single thing that goes in and out, and there's no room for human error because everything is done by machinery. Yes, the people that are still there to kind of physically look at those panels and the cells and the wafers that are all coming out. But everything else other than that is all done by machines. So everything is recorded somewhere in the database and you can always pull it out if, you know, say there's an issue, we can always pull it out. So yeah, so on that note in itself, because everything is automated, we're trying to run the plan, you know, across the clock. And all you need is just, you know, people on shift looking at maybe a screen, for example, just to make sure everything is fine. And 
yeah, and hopefully that you know can increase um, our efficiency efficiency in production in that in that in that sense. Wow. I mean, Singapore is such an amazing story. Um, a country with no natural resources at all is just like a superpower of, of energy and resourcefulness. Yeah. Yeah, it's really amazing. I've been there many times. Um, my friend Ruff describes it as the the Switzerland of uh, Asia. <laughs> <laughs> it's very clean, it's very well organized, <laughs> and it's expensive. <laughs> that is very true. <laughs> it all ties in together. <laughs> so like, yeah. I mean, back in Singapore as well, like just coming from there, it's great to know that, you know, we pride ourselves on, you know, again, we have no natural resources. There's nothing really um, that we can kind of utilize besides mm. the one and only resource that we have, which is ourselves. Mm. So we always try and innovate. We're trying to be ahead. We have to be, like, it's not a choice being mm. in Singapore because if you're not, if you're just, if you're falling behind, we have nothing else to fall back on. We can't sell, you know, natural resources. We don't have land. We're just a tiny dot. So mm. our human, our brain and whatever we can do is that's what we have and that's what we can give. And you're on a major shipping route too. That must help. Exactly right. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen some of the pictures, you know, looking out the ocean, there's like a hundred container ships out there <laughs> yeah, yeah. waiting to come in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, they're trying to build a bigger port, but yeah. you know, hopefully that comes in time. <laughs> but exactly right. Like, right is, is a big thing there. Yeah. 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 So coming back to the panel, what's the panel we're looking at today called? So the panel that we're looking at today, it's called the um, L REC Alpha Pure R. So it's the third iteration of the Alpha series. So we have the Alphas and even the Alpha Pures, and now we have the Alpha Pure Rs, or Alpha Pure R, <laughs> the R at the end. <laughs> what's, what, what's the significance of the R at the end? Um, many different things, but you know, it's mostly just Pure. It's an, ev it's, an ev it's an evolution of the product. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, basically, right. It's not R-type. <laughs> no, I got gotcha. you. So, I mean, hopefully. So looking at the data sheet here, straight away, um, a couple of interesting things is the form factor of the panel itself. So you've got uh, junction boxes along one side. Yes. Okay. So let's talk about the, the panel aesthetics in a sense, right? So we'll just look at that and we'll go on to the more technical side of things. So the panel aesthetics in itself is, as you can already see, on the right side, looking at the panel in itself. So the 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 kind of the junction boxes usually is at the top. So usually at the top of the panel, you would see like a little fat side, and then everything else is kind of thinner. But for the Alpha Pure R, because our junction boxes are on the right side, on the side of the panel, that it's you get the little fat kind of like black line there. But I think it just makes it look a little bit more different, and you can immediately spot whether it's a an Alpha Pure R panel or like another shingle panel in that sense. It's just by you look at the panel in itself. It identifies itself by itself, right? You know, there's nothing else that you kind of look and have to consider about that. So that's number one, the bus bias on the side. Number two is, so you can see here as well, the layout is a bit different where you have four sections of the panel um, going from top to bottom. So it's not left to right anymore. So in, in the past, right, you have your fast bars kind of left to right and the cells going up and down mm -hmm. in that manner. For us, it's, it goes in a vertical form. So it goes from um, left to right in that sense, but from up to down. So I think this change is also beneficial or I don't see other panels doing that. And I think it's beneficial as well because when you install a panel up in your roof, right, it's very rare that you get your shade from left to right. It's more likely creeping up from bottom to top, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with the the section of of cells or the wafers in that sense, those sections are going from up top to bottom. What it does is that it kind of segments the the way how the shading works. And because yeah. it creeps up from the bottom to the top, that if let's say it fits only just a quarter of the panel, you only get a quarter loss, not the whole half of it, if that makes sense. So I think that design is in itself as well is very revolutionary at least to me because I've not seen a panel that has done that yet um, but yeah that's just purely with the aesthetics of it and just like the looks of that. John tell me about the arrangement of the bypass diodes on the panels and how that is designed to minimize shading. Okay so it's very interesting so the Alpha Pure R is very different in the sense of that usually you get three bypass diodes on your panel. The Alpha Pure R has four bypass diodes and it goes from top to bottom so as you can see from here, you can see that the sections are also very different from your usual panel. 
So usual panel goes from left to right. You get one, two, three vertically from left to right. For ours, we have our sections horizontally stacked. So one, two, three, four. And because of the four bypass diodes, now you have four different sections. So what does that mean? First of all is whenever you have shading on your panel, for example, you have four sections now instead of three. So efficiently, efficiently, yeah. In terms of efficiency wise, you go from 33% to just 25% loss, right? Small percentages, but again, in a solar panel space where every single 0.1% kind of matters, I think that's a huge jump. Yeah. So first of all, that's that. Number two is because it's up to down as well, what it happens is the shading is now split in accordance to how far the shadow creeps up from bottom to top, not from left to right. And I think that's a great way as well um, in terms of looking at shade on a normal roof because usually shade comes in from bottom to top. Let's say there's a tree, there's a chimney, um, there's something that swivels around, right? That causes shading. Sometimes it covers from horizontally more so than vertically and therefore you get that you know, you lose less overall. I can see another application too, in, in commercial we've got predominantly flat roofs and you've yep. got rows of panels. Early in the day, mm. you'll be casting a shadow on the panel behind, across the bottom third or quarter. Exactly and, right. Yeah, which would normally turn off panels which have vertically orientated segments, would turn off that whole section. Exactly right. Yeah. So again, ideally in terms of the design wise, you don't want to have that to happen, but if it does do happen, exactly yeah. right. Like. Yeah this panel in itself, the Alpha PORs, because of how the junction boxes are kind of designed and how the connections are designed on the panel in itself, that, yes, if you cast, you know, from bottom to top, you lose less power overall than your normal standard panel from left to right. Are these panels aimed at the res residential market or commercial or both? You can use them for whatever use you want, to be really honest. Yep. Um, but it's mostly for residential mm -hmm. in the sense of because of how aesthetically pleasing it looks as well. Yes. It's a whole, the all black panel, you know, it doesn't have anything, any silver lining, any silver bus bars or anything like that on there. So the bus bars are black? Yeah. No, actually, there is actually no bus bar. All right. So <laughs> let me show you something very, very hey, interesting here. Really? How do you do that? <laughs> so what we do is, so our cells is what we call, we have a gapless cell technology. So yes. the cells in itself are just, lay it close enough to be in contact, but there is no soldering involved. So as mentioned before, like in the plant, in, in the single plant itself, this is mind blowing, right? Because I, from an electrical engineering background, you know, with everything you want to, if you want to match two pieces of metal together, yes. you have to either solder or, you know, you weld them together. There's some sort of heat involved, right? To kind of join them together. But when we went to the plant, there is no such thing everything is kind of printed or screen printed in that sense. You get there, it just kind of like goes through and then it comes out and that's all your connections there straight away. No soldering involved, nothing like that. There is no heat induced into any of these panels or any of these connections. And therefore, because there's no heat involved, or I would say low heat involved, no soldering, anything like that, that you have that, that sort of resistive loss or that kind of, um, error that kind of goes away. You know, you don't burn any of the, the cells. You don't have to induce any stress on these cells or wafers, right? Everything is just kind of matched perfectly together, side by side. And because there's no soldering as well, that helps us in to making our panels lead free as well, or oh, ROHS compliant. Right. Because there's no lead involved in, in the use of the soldering. And even if there is any sort of small soldering involved, or any wiring, anything like that, it's all lead free. Yes. So we have used lead free soldering for those um, applications. And yeah, it's just really mind blowing to see how the cells in itself, like we used to have bus bars and now it's no bus bars. Everything's just, you know, connected very meticulously and very intricately together that it's connected. Would you describe that as shingling? Um, in, in some sort, but it's, not at the same time if it kind of makes sense. Like so The cells aren't sitting on top of each other, slightly overlap like shingles on a roof. They're just abutting. Yeah, yeah. So if you if you look at at the slide that we're going to show you here, so it's just very closely overlapped. So in that sense, it's yes, like shingling does the same thing. Yes. It's very similar. But what I've been told is it's, a, it's also a little bit different, but then again, it's a, it's a oh, trade okay. secret. Trade secret, fair enough. <laughs> Let's call it gapless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. gapless cell technology, <laughs> that's like what it. they call it. 
But um, I guess one of the advantages, apart from the fact that it's lead free, is that um, the coverage is is more complete too. So there's no wasted area on the on the the panel. Exactly right. So as you can see on the the screen here, because of the lack of soldering, mm -hmm. because again, and there's lack of bar spars, you're actually improving the area that the cells can occupy, or you don't need that much of a I would like to say wasted space because if you only have your bus bars, it's a needed space. But because that's gone, it's cell shading. The bus bar shades part of the cell. Exactly. Yeah. Mm. So you can actually actually kind of compress the panel a little bit smaller. And mm. again, when in a solar panel space where every single millimeter matters, these small savings will add up on the overall shape of the panel and the overall size of the panel as well. Yeah. Now, I've heard people say that having lots of bus bars, like, you know, 10 or 12, helps reduce the effects of micro-cracking. Is there any correlation with the way you do it with the gapless technology in terms of the effects of micro-cracking? Okay, so in terms of micro-cracking in itself, that's when you worry about micro-cracking. Mm -hmm. So we, instead of trying to worry about how, or rather, whether the bus bars would help in micro-cracking, so what we do is our cells, we try and make them as robust as possible. So, as you can see here, our cells actually bend quite a bit. Whoa! Okay. Yeah. So, it actually bends to a point where you think it would crack. On the normal cell, it would crack. But the REC alphas and alpha pure Rs in this sense, the cells actually are flexible enough that it wouldn't cause a problem if there is any sort of... Unless you don't excessively put force into it. Yes. Otherwise, it should still hold up. Um, do you know the thickness of the cells? Um, thickness of the cells, um, unfortunately not. That's okay. It's just the reason I ask is I, I remember talking to uh, uh, someone who used to be involved in cell manufacture in Sydney when they used to make panels in, in Australia at, yeah. at the what was then the BP plant. And he was saying that microcracking wasn't a problem when cells were thick. Yeah. It became a problem when cells got thinner. Yeah. But he said it would go away again when cells got thinner even they become Further. flexible and yes. so I guess you've got to that point. Yes, exactly you, right. And as long as the cells are more flexible than the glass that encapsulates them, then they're you not going to bend to a breaking point. Exactly right. So like you say, you really don't have to worry about micro-cracking. Yeah. It's more about someone broke the glass and that's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or someone actually steps on the panel, but you know, we want to always avoid that. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Don't walk on your panels, okay? <laughs> <laughs> now, um, um, you've got a slide here showing uh, P mono perk. Now, perk um, passive emitter rear collector. What's that all about? So that is just really, I guess, the type of technology that it comes by um, in terms of how the P-type, again, like, so P-type you have your, I guess you have your P-type mono perk, right? And then you get into your N-type and then you get into um, or what we call as a HAT and that's what we have, the cells that we're using right now. So I want to just introduce to you um, the cell or how our cell is kind of made, or how wafers are kind of made, right? So going back to the whole issue about, you know, P-type, N-type, and the different types of um, and mono perk in that sense as well, like how it all comes by together. So what we do here is that what we, the, the cell that we use is called the heterojunction cell or HJT cell. So what we do here is we actually combine a few types of the, this, the technologies used in the past. I think mm. that's a good way to put it, right? So we're not actually innovating anything new we're actually taking technologies of the past, put them together to create something new. And I think that's ingenious because that's how Singaporeans are as well and how we are as a people where we combine the talents of everyone and you get a, a better byproduct out of it. So as you can see here, like for example, instead of using the P-type, we have the N-type mono wafers. Mm -hmm. So again, because the whole P-type, N-type, N-type is more efficient, so we use the bulk of that as the bulk of our wafers. Now, on top of that as well, because what we want to do is increase bifaciality of our wafers in the cells. So what we do is, there was a time where amorphous silicon was a thing, where flexible panels were a thing. Yes, I've got some of them out there, <laughs> the little 60 waters. Yes. Yep, yeah, yeah. so those were a thing, but again, its efficiency was, you mm, know... 7%. Just, yeah. It's terrible, <laughs> terrible. Yeah. It's, it's a great idea. I like, I love the idea of it. When Good I was... for your pocket calculators that you sit, sit on your desk. Exactly right, yeah. <laughs> you know, you use them so many in, in so many areas. Yes. But on a solar panel on your roof, you want to get, you know, the most amount of power per meter squared, flexible, the, the amorphous silicon is not really going to work out for you. But we want to use that, that technology from there. Because 
again, it's used in so many small applications that has its users. And so we were like, well, why don't we just combine it together, right? We have your end type, which is really efficient. Now we want to use some of the technology and some of the benefits of this MFR silicon. And so we just combine that together. Now then on top of that as well, we just, uh, we just put a transparent conductive oxide on top. So it just kind of sits all together and both top and bottom are the same. So it is our, our panels and our cells are bifacial, but it is not because we have our black our, our, our back sheet. Hang on, let me just take that apart a little bit. Yeah. So you've got um, a base layer of N-type, a mono wafer, which has bifaciality. Yes. But you do using that bifaciality within the module, not from reflected light from behind. So like it's reflecting from the back sheet. Yes, exactly right. So there's an internal reflection. Yes. Then you've got a layer on top of that of amorphous silicon. Yes. Now, surely putting a layer of amorphous silicon on top of N-type would shade it. Why does it not shade it? So again, trade secret. Oh. But, but, <laughs> but. So this is why, okay, this is why I'm very- You're gonna have to kill me after yeah. this, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is the last video, see <laughs> um, Well, okay, this is why Alpha Pure R was such a, a revolutionary change when we went to the plant in itself, right? Yes. So again, unfortunately, I can't say the percentages of what is being used in there. Yes. But this is why it's, it's things that you're like, well, it shouldn't work, right? Like, you know, it, it, you get your amorphous silicon, it, it, it would shade the end. Why would you ever do something like this, right? So this is where, like, I think REC is, and the position of, of our company is, just, we're just trying to push that limit, right? Every time someone says, no, you can't do this, it's where you have to kind of look at it and be like, what if, but what if we could? What if this works? Yeah. And so, with three iterations ready, we had the alphas that started with this whole heterojunction cell technology, and then we get the alpha pures, which then improved on that, and the pure Rs, and now, because we have a past set of data that we could use, right, that we can now, you know, change the percentages of what goes in into the cells, into the wafers in itself. So yes, the amorphous silicon technically would shade the N-type panel, but the benefits of that, and again, percentages wise using it so that it doesn't completely eliminate the end type wafer that's in there in the middle that what it gives in terms of like the temperature um the, that's how we we hit such a low temperature coefficient because of that oh, because of the low temperature just um okay, the so position of that that's another plus then yeah so just coming back to the amorphous silicon layer uh, I, I i imagine it must be very very thin because at a, at a sort of an atomic level there's a lot of gaps between atoms yeah and those photons go miss a lot of those uh silicon atoms all together and go through to the next layer yeah. so it's not really like you're putting an opaque material on top of the end type yeah you're putting a translucent to to photons material yeah so it's picking up some of them missing some of them the end types there to catch them exactly right but then you know, on top you've got an amazing material called a transparent conductive oxide. I imagine that's iridium or something similar. Um, transparent conductive material? That's amazing. Yeah. So again, when we went to the plant in itself, it, it, it goes through so many, um, what we call as chemical curings for the panel and the cell in itself. Mm. To give it its flexibility and its durability and its robustness at the same time still keeping everything that you would want in a cell. Right? Wow. The conductiveness and everything like that. And adding on to that, then this is why everything has to be, m m well, using machines, I guess. Like, yes. Because, again, it's so thin and it's so precise. Yes. That you can't afford to have it, you know, down to like the micrometer. So, this is why I think, Ari, like in terms of the plant in itself, it was so amazing to watch how things have changed, you know, across the years. You know, I look back and you get, you know, same for REC, it started off, you know, with just hand washing wafers, you know, very physically laborious. And now everything's just through machines to like, again, as you said, the thin, very thin, very minute and minuscule differences can cause such a big difference, but yet it's still the same every single time. Yeah. Hey, um, so the HJC, hetero junction cells, uh, with that extra boost in performance because it, it's basically two two cells in one. Yeah. Um, let me take you on a little journey. Jump on my time machine. Go back to 2010. Yeah. I remember installing uh, San Sanyo H HIT, so hetero intrinsic thin film panels, mm. similar concept. Yeah. But they were like two times the price of everything else. Yeah. 
uh, or even more. They were really, really expensive, at least didn't catch on. Have you solved the price problem? We actually have. It's just because, okay, so technology has increased and improved so much, you know, back in 2010, yeah. and like it has only been, what, 13 years? Yes. But in terms of machinery wise, um, technology wise, everything has improved in that sense. And again, like, yes, we do agree that, you know, price of the HJT or like the manufacturing of, of the HJT might be a little bit more, but in terms of what not you get- three times that, more. No, not three <laughs> times more. Not anymore, not <laughs> anymore, not in that, that scale. Yeah. So it might just be like, because of, of everything that's improving and, and again, not just a solar panel um, sector that's actually evolving and, and, and improving themselves, same with the machines that produces these cells as well. They have been doing their research, they have been you know, outputting. Again, like the same with our phones, right? Yes. Back then you'd have like a Nokia, which costs the same price as an iPhone now, but the technology is so different. And it's like a span of what, 14 years? Because it's iPhone 14 now? Yes. So it's been of 14 years, things have sped up so quickly. Technology and machinery has sped up as well, evolution of that as well. So price point wise, we managed to keep it at a fairly low, not three times, yes. like not a fairly cost, low cost, but still get everything out in that sense. I'm curious about the cell efficiency with the HJC technology. Do you, do you know offhand what that is? Efficiency of the cell in itself. Hmm. I think they were saying it's somewhere between the percentages of 22 to 25%, if I'm not wrong. Yeah, okay. Wow. That's pretty impressive. Wow. Yeah. Considering that, you know, back in the 70s, we were down at like 5%. Yeah. <laughs> I know like the P time is like, you know, 13 and <laughs> time is like 17, but yeah, it, it's yeah. getting progressively better and better. Yeah. And yeah. again, like because we're using a combination of different technologies. Yeah. Just kind of push it up. Because after all, from the residential perspective, your resource is your roof and your roof is a limited space and getting more energy off that limited space is what it's all about. Exactly right. Yeah. So with, with REC, with us as well, so something that we like to do, and I think this is how we want to go forward as well is, we understand that solar panels, right, you want a 600 watt panel, sure, you need to have that size to accommodate for that. For REC, we don't really believe in that. I think this is where the fork in the road happens again for us. Yeah. We want to get the most power density yep. out of your roof or out of the panel, which is what, what we brand as, you know, we want, um, we don't want to be bigger, we want it to be better. Yeah. So better, not bigger. Yeah. Cool. So let's come back to the data sheet. I had a quick look at it before on my computer, and the first thing that got me was that these panels have quite a high uh, VMP and uh, mm -hmm. quite a low IMP and low ISC. Yes. What was the principles behind that? So as you know, as we discussed before, like you know how the, the half cut cell actually kind of mm -hmm. improves efficiency overall because of the low resistive losses. Mm -hmm. Same thing here. So that's why what I was talking about then was the Alpha Pure RS and how. We took it a step further is again we try and drop the current and improve the voltage so this it's a two-pronged effect that helps our panel so first of all okay no low current you know you get low resistive technologies or low resistance sorry and so therefore you get lower resistance losses on top of that as well we have a low one of the lowest temperature coefficients in terms of VOC wise. So it's minus 0.24%. Wow. A lot of others are 0.26, 27, 32, et cetera, et cetera. What did you say it was? Two? Minus 0.24%. Two four, okay. Yeah, our VOC oh, yeah, on the right. There, right. Yeah. Wow, that is, that is really good. For those who are not familiar with this uh, temperature coefficient thing, basically panels as they heat up, lose power. Mm -hmm. And the coefficient is the rate that they lose power at. So a lower coefficient, because it's a negative coefficient, the better. That means on a hot day, you're still producing lots of power. You're not not uh, losing it to physics. So yeah, that's another way of squeezing more out of the same thing. Exactly. And we kind of doubled down on that mm -hmm. because again, because we reduce current, yep. but to produce the same amount of power, you need yep. to jack up something, right? It's yep. either power, it's either P because IV, so either current or voltage. So with our leading voltage coefficient, of, you know, at minus 0.24%, we double down and so we improve or increase our voltage so that even on a hot day, because of the high voltage and the low voltage coefficient, you're actually losing a little bit less power overall. Yeah. Again, kind of just to reiterate, solar panels, industry, every single percent, every single watt count. And when we do that, I think it's, again, like small things like this, I think positions us out of the market where we Think of the panel as a holistic, like in a, as a whole, a holistically, um, everything in there and every change that we make has to 
benefit the customer in some way. I'm, I'm thinking you must be happy with 5033, the 2020 edition, raising uh, the domestic voltage up to 1,000 volts now. So it makes it possible to get a lot more panels in series. Exactly right. We've still got a little problem with 4777, but we're, yeah. working, we're working on it right now. Don't you worry. Um, we'll solve that one shortly. Um, there is, you know, you could say it's just a hiccup, but it's the fact that there's different standards overlapped at that point. Yeah. But uh, certainly for anyone off-grid or DC coupled, uh, 1,000 volts domestic is the go right now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And that would really suit your panels too, because per panel at about you know 60 volts open circuit, um, you probably want to be around the nine panels on a 600 volt system. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, yeah, 600 volt system for now. But for now, yeah. As we but get a thousand volts, yeah, you, you'd be at 12, 13, 14. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, also, with the lower current, you could probably parallel and still meet the input limits of mini inverters, because you could put two strings and you're only running it. So, what's your IMP? Around it's, about eight and a half amps. Yeah. So I have actually have drawn up something. It's a little bit unrefined. I'm not gonna lie. All right, it was done on PowerPoint. All right, give me give me a break. But it kind of explains <laughs> how our how our panel can be installed on a more physical aspect. Oh, right? good, so good, good, good. Yep. We have this parallel, the strings design. Mm -hmm. Then I kind of so I've just used a very generic inverter. Yep. Yes. Yep. Um, and you can see here, so they have different MPPTs as well, right? MPPT1, MPPT2, there's unbalanced MPPTs. Perfectly fine. Now, in that case as well, if in a case that you ever want to do a three parallel install on one MPPT for reasons, yep. you can, especially with our panel as well, because of the low current. When you parallel, that, parallel them together, right? Our IC is 8.92, you get that on three different strings, you parallel them together. You probably need a fuse, fuse protection because Fronius has a 25 amp fuse protection. This goes up to 26.7. So you might need a separate fuse protection for that. But it is possible to kind of parallel them together in that case. So if you do need a design that needs to do three different strings in three different um, orientations, for example, to one MPPT, perfectly fine because our, our, our low IMP and ISC. Hang on, what's the series fuse for these panels? Um, 25. 25 amps. It's right there at the bottom there. Right, so you wouldn't need series fuses. Oh, sorry, you wouldn't need um, uh, string fuses because uh, n minus one strings is less than twenty-five. True. So True. You're, you're all good. So I, I think what the point you're making here is, even though these three strings can put out twenty-six point seven six amps, the input limit of the MPPT being twenty-two is not actually a problem. Yeah. I mean, uh, many people think that when they see the inverter says maximum input current twenty-two amps, you can't go over it. Well. They forget that the inverter is in charge. The inverter actually is a smart load. It controls the current that it chooses to draw from the panels. So you might think, well, that's a bad idea. I'm not getting all the current out of my panels. But basically, um, it's about maximum production over the day. Exactly right. Yeah, and every day isn't a perfect sunny day. I can tell you that in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> right now. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, and really incentives are about more solar. Yeah. So getting more production for more of the day means oversizing makes a lot of sense. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. So the oversizing thing as well kind but of plays There are it. some limits though. The ISC of the inverter, you still need to consider that to make some short circuit current. But you know, many inverters like Fronius have quite high uh, maximum short circuit currents. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So in that case is, you know, we we'll, would pair with our inverters as well. Like it has the same limitations. So one of the designs that we've kind of made as well in terms of this is if we go back to the old Sungro five kilowatts, right? So you, that still works in our in our case as well. Yes. But the only thing is because I think the old five Ks, I've been told that it's now upgrading or they've been changing it to um, same as twenty amps. But when it when it was only you, ten amps. Sorry, you're talking about the ISC of the Sungro uh, hybrid. Yeah, yeah. Or, or how they can, how much ISC they can only take in. Yeah. So we I put the data sheet here, and you know the max PV input current here. They put it's only twenty amps or 10 amp per MPPT. So yep. if that happens, still not a problem, it's still possible. This is just, I'm just taking an example where you have inverters that still has this 10 amp limit on their MPPTs. I know more and more inverters are now moving up to 20 and so that will be less of a problem. But if you still have an inverter, let's say you have an old install, right, and an old inverter that still works and you still want to use them, and it goes up, up to 10 amps, you can still use our panel and that's not a problem. Yeah. Whereas I know a lot of panel nowadays where low voltage, but they jack up their currents and their currents are going above, you know, 12, 13, 14, this will not be possible. Yeah, yeah. 
You know, from a design point of view, I often look at the ratio of ISC to uh, series fuse rating. Yeah. Uh, and you've got a very big ratio, which is great, which yeah. means you can go a lot of parallel strings before having to put in string fusing, which is extra costs, extra points of failure. Exactly right. In fact, you know, you'd be probably a market leader for that at 25 amps. So that's that's pretty impressive. Yeah. I was trying to push the limits there. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's that gapless technology that gets you there. <laughs> that's all right. I'm feeling like I'm something's got bad going to happen to me. I keep asking too many questions. So, you're fine here. You're fine here. <laughs> yeah. So um, just actually taking a bit of a change of direction for a moment. Um, like you obviously know an awful lot about um, PV and solar. How did you get to be, you know, doing this sort of stuff? What's your career path? So, well, I studied electrical engineering in UNSW, yep. so back in Sydney, 2015. Best place in the world. <laughs> Can't say it on the camera. <laughs> but yeah, I enjoyed my time there. It was great. You know, I've learned yep. a lot there yep. in terms of um, engineering, electrical and everything like that in between. Yes. So after that, um, I graduated and I got into, actually got hired at Enphase, Enphase Energy. And this is back when um, the IQ7s were still coming out. They were still on the S-Series micros. I got some on the wall over there. Yeah, yeah. exactly right. Yeah, when I, I saw them, I was like, this is pretty old. <laughs> I've not seen them in a while. So yeah, so I started my journey, my solo journey there at Enphase. And yeah, it was, it was great. I, I always, so when I did electrical engineering, like you're always at your end of the, you know, your, your last year, penultimate year, you're trying to think about what you want to do and what you want to, where career, where your career wants to take you. So part of it is, it sounds a little bit cheesy, but like I always want to do something good for the world in in some way. It's good cheese. <laughs> it really is. I hope, I hope so. <laughs> no one's cringing at home right now. Um, and so I was like, look, I would want ideally to, to go into actually to win energy because back then that's the only thing that I kind of knew. I didn't really know if geothermal was a thing here mm. or at least in Sydney, right? Mm. I know in, in other places, other states, it might be. And solar was just not a thing, right? It was there, but everyone was still on that, you know, and I guess in 2015, everyone was just still solar's too expensive. You know, you, get, you, you can't run anything else other than your hot water on solar. So there's really no like future for it, I guess, in that sense, than when I was studying. But then when I was stepped into Enphase and I got into the solar world and I was like, how wrong that everyone was still on that, you know, that backwards thinking. And it's just like, it's so, it's moving so quickly in the solar, in the solar world, right? You know, 2015, we had, you know, 330 watt panel and that was the base. And now we have, you know, 400 watt panels, you know, 415, 430s, easily just in the span of five years, we've, we've moved across so much. Yeah. So. I started Enphase Energy and it was great, you know, learning about microinverters, learning about panels. And because microinverters were such a new technology back then, like Enphase was still um, fairly new as opposed to the string inverter um, sector. So that challenge was actually very interesting to kind of tackle. Just trying to see how people think about solar, how how different technologies affect the panels, how are they accepted in, in the sector in itself. And again, all the different standards, as, as you would know, like, you know, back in 2015, the 350 watt limit. Oh, yeah. Boy, that was so terrible. Uh, yeah. And you get, you know, your. When we wrote that, panels were 150 watts. And we thought, we'll never get to 350 watts. Yeah, exactly. Well, you know, it didn't take long at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like this, and you're yeah. like, well, we're yeah. here. Yeah. By the way, there's no 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 limits now. So basically, uh, there's no such thing as microinverters as far as the standards are concerned. Exactly. It's just inverters with an ELV input. Exactly right. Yeah. They, call, they call them MLPEs now. Yeah. Yeah. So such a big change, you mm. know, back from when I was at Enphase and then across now. So I got my foot into that. Um, I did for a couple of years and then I went into retail. So I went to see how, trying to get into the minds of how installers actually work in that sense. So I was like, look, the best way to get into that, let's try selling, you know, let's try selling this and see how where it takes me, right? I've been tech, you know, throughout my uni life and then Enphase. So I was like, look, let's go on the front end and see how that goes, how, how, how that, 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 battle for you kind of is. And it was fairly interesting as well because then I get to learn about how customers are and how what they're looking for versus what we're actually providing, right? As tech guys, or at least for me, like I'm very tech nerd, I would say. In that sense. <laughs> I like to look at numbers a lot. And I was like, look, you know, this and that, this is benefits and stuff. And then customers look at different things altogether. So I did that for like another couple of years. And then, yeah, and I look at REC and I was like, look, it's a Singapore, well, it's a Norwegian company, but it's now based in Singapore, which where I'm from. I was like, that's great. I get to do it. So my role currently in REC, I'm a 
senior technical sales specialist. So basically everything, all the buzzwords you can find on a job description. That That's my role, right? And I'm happy to do that. I, I'm glad, you know, having this role, learning a lot. Um, again, I get back into this whole numbers game, but now with the knowledge of everything else, you know, the inverter side of things, how the customer is thinking and how they would like things to be. And then being at REC and how it's actually positioning itself, it's very eye-opening and it's also very pleasing, if that makes sense. Like how it's not all about just following, like just going down or like chasing something. Like REC is always being like, oh, they're going down this path, but let's try going yeah. Okay, so innovation. Yeah, innovation. Like, mm. I guess, you know, the, the buzzword is innovation, but in some sense, it's also just, you know, looking at mm. what what else outside the box that can be done. And that's where, you know, again, like innovation happens or that's where um, technology evolves, right? When you look at something that you think that can be done yep. and then you do it and then it works and then everyone suddenly, ah, oh, yeah, we always knew it would work. Yeah. So being at REC kind of just, just very eye-opening, just working with the tech team, the engineering team, and, and all those, you know, amazing people with great brains and great minds. It's just, yeah, it's just, I, I'm, I'm right now, you know, I've joined REC for like close to a year now and I'm, I'm still learning a lot and enjoying my time here. Yeah, cool. It's great you get to have trips home too. Is it family or friends? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a two, like it, it serves both purposes. Yep, so yep. I'm glad to have that as well. <laughs> hey, that's cool. Um, so we're coming sort of to the end of things. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to tell me a bit about um, the panel or REC that we haven't covered already? I think like the parting words, I would say for like the REC and the panel, like first of all for REC is um, it, it's a great company, you know, just, just being in the environment itself and how the engineering team is always thinking about ways to innovate at the same time, because I'm also after sales and we have one of the lowest warranty cases, I would say, one of the lowest amongst the other brands. And I know this for a fact because I'm the warranty guy, so if you need a warranty, you come to me. Right. And I don't we'll get- We'll just put your mobile phone number on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> Call me during work hours only, please. <laughs> but yeah, like the, the, the amount of warranties I get is not, is, is few and far between. And that opens up a lot of my time hmm. to do more experimentation here in Australia. Because again, we have different regions, you know, the US, you have, the U you have Europe, you have Asia, and they all have their things going on for them. And for me to actually experiment here, you know, on home ground, on home turf, it's it's great. Like having that time to do that is, is, is really um, extraordinary. And also because of how, again, the, everything is automated, everything's through machinery, everything is recorded. So even if there is a problem, we can immediately go back boom, 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 to which machine, which person, and, and where it actually is, and where did this problem appear, fix it right away, and then subsequent, you know, panels or anything that goes through that machine is then perfectly fine. And because again, because it's all machinery, it's always a duplicate, it's always a replication of things. Yeah. So. Very traceable. Yeah. Exactly, it's traceable, and, and the quality and the standard is all replicated, and it's all, you know, set to a certain standard, and it doesn't change. Yeah. So I think on that note, like, as, and the Alpha Pure R as well, like how, how much technology has advanced and how much things have improved over the years. Alpha Pure R, yes, it might not be the biggest wattage panel on the market. I'm pretty sure it's only up to 430 watts. I'm not going to lie. You know, you have your 470s, your 500s and stuff like that. For us, what we want to do is we want to kind of get the most power density out of our panel. And there is something actually that we we are kind of moving towards as well. So we believe now, right? We always think greatness doesn't end, it evolves, right? And we always want to do things better, not necessarily bigger. That's the direction that we want to move towards at this point. We want to make things better, not bigger. And in greatness doesn't end, it evolves. Well, I'm looking forward to getting my hands dirty on some REC panels. I believe Definitely. we're going to do a little project actually on the roof of my house. And I've got 12, I won't say what the brand is, but there are 250 watt panels which are going to go 
<laughs> replaced with some 400 and somethings in the same footprint. So there's the change. Exactly. We're basically, you know, getting another, you know, 40% more power out of the same roof area with quality. Exactly right. Yeah. And again, everything on there, you know, it's gonna last you. I won't say your lifetime, but mm. it is structured for your lifetime. Yep. 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 And so I'll, I'll link that up here um, when, when we've done it. So <laughs> you can you can watch that video as we install those panels. But anyway, yep. well, Sean, thanks for coming. It's been really informative. I've learned quite a lot about uh, REC and I'm really excited by the HJC technology. So I hadn't realized that's uh, what's embedded in there and the, uh, the secret <laughs> gapless <laughs> te technology as well. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, yeah, thanks for having me as well. Pleasure. Um, hope to work with you in the future as well. Okay.